Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the cohort three, tier three identified schools with no support in FY23-24 uh, technical assistance webinar. My name is Monique Sullivan and I am the continuous school improvement coordinator for the department. And although I'm listed under ESCA, I also work with the assessment team. And uh, under Maine's model of school supports, which falls under several sections of the ESSA statute, but specifically uh, Title I, sections or Section 1111 and Section 1003. Section 1111 is actually um, the part of the statute where it outlines all the different plan requirements um, and also sets up the requirements for the different tiers, um, which is uh, tier one, ATSI, tier two, uh, TSI, and tier three, ATSI. And those acronyms are actually uh, spelled out in the statute. And then section uh, 1003 is the funding that's attached to the schools that um, are identified. In Maine's model school support, the only the schools that are identified for um, tier three with support are the ones who receive um, section um, 1003 funds. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that um, in this presentation. So I just want to go through quickly, we have our mission, uh, the department's mission, the department's vision, and the strategic priorities. I'm not going to read them to you, but I just want to stress that this is the driving force behind all the work that we do at the department and all the work that we uh, do with our schools um, and educators across the state. So today's objectives um, are to learn about a Maine DOE sponsored professional learning opportunity that Transformational Leaders Network or TLN to understand the identification status or understand identification statuses, um, understand how to access and review school profiles, and then understand requirements of tier three uh, CSI school improvement plans. And lastly, I didn't put it on the agenda, but if you, there should be time at the end uh, for you to, to ask any questions or any clarifications that you may have. But I am going to stop because I want to go ahead and give Fran Farr. She's joined us and she um, works with the, coordinates the Transformational Leaders Network. And I wanted to stress that this is a main, or a, a, a professional learning opportunity that is sponsored by the Maine Department of Education. And as was indicated in the letters or notifications that um, these schools received, um, even though you're not gonna be getting any tier three or section 1003 funds, you do as a tier three, you get to be able to participate in main sponsor or main department of education sponsored professional learning opportunities. You can, you can participate in those at no cost. So, and this is one of those opportunities that you can participate in at no cost. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Fran. Oh, Fran, I think you're muted. Yes, as I said, I meant to, before I could, before I unmuted was that we are a bargain. What's, that's what Monique is telling you. And I just have to say hi to Angela Pratt because she's a former TLN -er. It's nice to see her on, on the screen. Um, I'm gonna take, take some time to talk about the TLN. And I, I'm really gonna use, um, a lot of quotes from uh, the participants from this past year because I don't, you know, otherwise I look like a used car salesman and I have no interest. I, I'd rather share their words than my words. So the mission of the, the TLN is to create an ongoing community of principals engaged in learning about themselves and their leadership. And a quote from one of the participants really captures the essence of our work. Quote, the TLN served as a reminder to be intentional in all ways, but especially with the focus of my energy and my attention. I want to aim for the areas of high impact. Yes, addressing the negativity is important, but building relationships and focusing on the people who are moving forward in a constructive and cohesive direction is critical. As staff, we are charged with carrying the banner for our school, Poor relationships, mistrust, and lack of clarity can silently kill a school culture. 
The TLN welcomes principals from across the, the, the entire state. Each year we have principals at varying levels in their career. This year, for example, we had a first year principal. We had a 19 year veteran. We had one who serves both as a principal and superintendent in a very small district. We have others, principals that have two schools, many who are mid-career, and some are considering are already engaged in uh, postgraduate or graduate work, but all of them are hardworking, dedicated administrators committed to leading for the betterment of education and the success of their students. So whether a principal of a tiny rural school with limited staff, where the leadership team is the entire staff, or a larger schools where principals have a separate leadership team, all continue to build and distribute leadership. One principal said, quote, improving my leadership skills directly enhances our school climate. Learning to communicate clearly with both employees and parents had, has had a significant positive impact on our school environment. And we have reoccurring th themes that run through the year depending on what the needs of the group and they include goal setting and communication and feedback and values and leadership and conflict management. We spend a lot of time talking about relationships and difficult conversations about school culture and climate, self-care and sustainability. Those are huge these days and a celebration of self, staff and communities. We're great at taking care of everybody else. We don't do such a good job of celebrating ourselves and reset, reflecting on our own wins and accomplishments. And it's imperative that we recognize our efforts. This will be our 13th year in operation, first serving identified schools. And then in 2019, with the urging of Commissioner Macon, the TLN expanded to welcome all school principals in the state. We'd love to have you sign up and register for the 2024-25 school year. This is a crazy time of year. And frankly, asking you to put the TLN at the top of your to-do list is a big ask. So let me simply say that you'll have access to the information on the DOE website. In the next couple of weeks, it'll be live by scrolling through a drop-down menu under educators, leadership, professional uh, leadership offerings, you click on the TLN page, and then there's a QR code where you can register. Additionally, you'll see a, you're gonna receive a blast through the DOE media that's gonna to go to all school superintendents and principals before the end of the month with specific information. And then in August, the educational summit on August 6th, 7th, and 8th, there are plans in the works to share videos and testimonials from former TLM members sharing their highlights of the program. And there will also be an opportunity on that day to sign up on site. We really pride ourselves on being flexible and open. As facilitators, we're all current or former school administrators and recognize the monumental job that you do each and every day. The work is never done. We are committed to learning together, to searching for answers and networking and building a community. These conversations are held confidential. It's a big state, but it's a small state. And the conversations are between and among school leaders. Who better to work through issues than others experiencing similar circumstances and situations? To quote a principal, becoming a school leader and fully embracing the transition for the beautiful mess that it can be. The network will be held in six in-person, we'll have, we have meetings every month, but six will be held in person in September, October, December, March, May, and June. And then we'll have four remote or regional meetings in November, January, February, and April. And those dates will be forthcoming for the regional meetings. And also I had a question earlier in the first session this morning about where the venues will be held. And that really is going to depend on where the preponderance of people lie. Uh, in, the past, um, in the past few years, we've been at, at Jeff's Catering in Brewer, which seems to be the most centrally located. But we had a year where we had a, we had a group in, in uh, Auburn and a group in Augusta. And if we need to go to Presque Isle, I mean, we're, we're, we're gonna go where you are. It's important that we come to you. Uh, so I want you to think about the, the dates and um, uh, hopefully you'll be able to squeeze time into your busy schedule. I'm gonna put them on the in the chat after I'm finished talking. 
We accept ro uh, registrations on a rolling basis. Uh, this past year, we had a participant who didn't join us until December. She was pregnant, had a baby, had maternity leave, and then joined us in December. So our sessions are based on your needs. This is not a course. We do not require homework. We often take the essence of a current article or a book that we're reading, synthesize the information and discuss key points using protocols and consultancy models. We gather input at the close of every meeting to determine what's working, what needs work, and what next. Then we use the results to inform our next session, pulling together the most current research and articles to share. And after reading and listening to this year's responses, we could not ignore the fact that we're still in turbulent times filled with continued chaos and difficult situations. And consequent, consequently, we're gonna focus on a theme of exploring and expanding the emotional intelligence of school leaders in our work. We found a couple of great resources, books that will be distributed to all members to guide us in another productive and meaningful year of principles leadership growth. For me personally, this network represents what I wished I'd had as a principal. A principalship is often a lonely, solitary job. When you believe in education and you develop a and you want to develop a positive success for those you lead, but it often feels like you're in the wrong place and you're always wrong in someone's eyes. You're the middle manager. You're pressed on the one side by staff and on the other side by central office and parents and community. And you have to keep working to maintain your balance and your integrity and choose where you're going to stand to uphold the tenets of education because you pledged yourself to focus on this always, on doing what's best for kids, not what's easiest for adults. At our first session last August, we asked, what do you hope for? And one principal responded, the challenges of leadership hit a climax last year. I'm hoping that participating in the TLN will help me see the joy again in serving my school commitments. I'm excited to collaborate with other leaders, to learn from them, and to support each other. And then, in closing, what better way to close than with another message from a principal who said, we dream together about what education can be, and we walk out the door refreshed and ready to take on the next day. So thank you for listening to my uh, pledge to be there to support principals, and we hope that you're going to take us up on this. If you have any questions, uh, you can certainly write them in the chat, and I'm happy to respond. Thanks. Thanks, Monique. Okay, just wanted to put back the share. I did take the share off because I wanted people to focus on Fran and not what was coming up. So again, I just want to stress that this is this is a professional learning opportunity that would be paid by the department. Um, and this is one of the uh, supports that we provide to schools that are identified but are not receiving Section 1003 funds. And you may think more about this as we get through the end of this presentation because you might start seeing some of the requirements and you might need the TLN uh, for your school principal. I know some of you are not school principals. Some of you are. Some of you wear many hats in your schools uh, or in your school or in your district. So um, I think it's a good thing to think about, um, especially as we you start thinking about your continued school improvement process. Okay. So um, first thing I wanted to talk about was just the identification. And for a variety of reasons, our identification was a little delayed this year, but in general, Maine's model of school support is run every year um, where the numbers are run um, using the data, but identifications are not are made every three years for tier two, which is CSI and tier three, which is CSI. Um, TSI is targeted school improvement. CSI is comprehensive school improvement. And then every six years for tier one, which is ATSI, which is additional targeted school improvement. Uh, Maine has changed it to tier one, tier two, and tier three. Uh, the next identification cycle will be the fall of 2027. And then eligibility to exit tier three status or convert to another status, which could be tier one, would be the fall of 2027. Now, I put a little asterisk down here because 
depending on the data that we get on the off cycle years that we don't identify, like for next year, um, depending on that status, um, a school may convert to another status, uh, maybe with with funding or with uh, with tier three supports, um, depending on the assessment results. So for this group, and I do apologize, I've done quite a few of these Zoom meetings, as you guys will see on the next slide, there are quite a few identification statuses right now under Maine's model school support, but this one is about, it's, we're calling it cohort three, because this is the third year or the third time we've made identifications. Um, so cohort three or any identifications that are made in FY23-24, um, we have tier three, CSI with no support identified in FY23-24. The status is for three years. Um, and these are schools that were identified as tier three. They met all the tier three criteria, but they were outside the 5%, which is determined in statute, in uh, federal statute and in Maine's model school support state accountability plan. In Maine's model school support accountability plan, and I'll put a link into the chat where you can go in and read that plan if you would like. Um, and we, um, in the plan, it states that means only going to provide uh, by, um, additional monies and school and some other supports for schools that are within or the 5%, the, the, the basically the most needy 5%. And, um, and the way, and then the model explains that. So in this particular situation, you're tier three, you meet all the criteria, but you're outside that 5%. Um, and tier three means all populations or all student populations are experiencing challenges, which is emerging across all indicators. And I have a couple of slides that will show um, what that looks like on a school profile. Um, and then uh, this group will be eligible to exit tier three status in the fall of 2027, that'll be three years. Um, and then there are a couple of options. Um, you can exit status, tier three status with no support. That means no student populations are experiencing challenges across all indicators. You could exit into tier one ATSI um, status, which means there's still at least one student group that's experiencing challenges across all indicators. And then you could potentially convert to another status, maybe tier three status, but you now get section 1003 support. This means that you are unable to exit tier three status because all student populations are still experiencing challenges. So this just kind of gives you an idea of the path and where it is. I do want to say that, um, maybe I'll talk about it the next slide, but typically we wouldn't make identifications back to back. Um, our first identification was in FY1819. And then due to COVID, two years in COVID, we had two years where we didn't um, do identifications because of COVID and then um, we also had a year where we, um, the department switched assessments, as you guys all know, and then we had to amend the plan, and then we had to get approval of the plan. And last year, the ESCA um, office was, a program was audited, and the U.S. Department of Education said, well, you have to make identifications in 22-23. So they did. I wasn't in this position at the time. And then they said, oh, but you can't exit anybody. You have to identify, but you can't exit. So fast forward to 23, 24, we can now exit, but they want us to, they wanted us to uh, make identifications again because we're now using a different assessment. So last year's um, was uh, norm referenced and WA was norm referenced. And I think you guys probably know this already. And then this year uh, it has, it's criterion reference. So they want us to make identifications under both uh, models. We are hoping that this year, 23-24, will start the three-year cycle again. Um, there will be some schools that are kind of in an off cycle because they were identified in 22-23 or they were in an unable to exit status um, or some kind of status like that. So again, typically I told, um, I've been telling schools that we normally wouldn't tell you two years in a row. You wouldn't get letters two years in a row about identifications, but this, you know, this is what's happening with having two identification years back to back. And I also just wanted to give you guys a little bit of an update why it's been taking so long. Um, identifications were delayed this year. Typically you wanna make identifications where you wanna make identifications like in fall or November. Um, and we have to wait till the fall because there's certain data points um, that are not, um, 
uh, they're not validated until like September, October. So that's why it pushes it back. Uh, but it's not NWA data or May three year assessment will be ready in time, but it's other data points that are not. So we had to, we had that, and then we had to wait for our plan to get approved or our amended plan to get approved. And all that didn't come through until about the end of March. Um, and that, or actually like late February, early March, but then we had to make sure that all of our numbers calibrated. So that took a few weeks um, uh, with our data. Um, we had some data people. And then so we weren't able to actually make identifications until like the end of April um, and you know continuing through into May. So that's where we are today. So I wanted to give you guys an update of where we are. So tier three, we had some tier three uh, uh, schools that um, they were identified back in 1819. Um, and now they're able to exit and they were. So we had 13 schools that were able to exit tier three status um, with no support. We have 23 schools that were able to exit tier one status, uh, but I'm sorry, tier three status, but now they're getting tier one support because they have at least one student population that is experiencing challenges. Then we had 13 schools that were eligible to exit but they still met the criteria for tier three, and so they are unable to exit. Um, and then we have two groups of tier threes that they couldn't exit because they weren't eligible because they're still in their three-year cycle. So we have 20 that were identified. Um, we have 20 and 27 that were identified, 50 or 47 that were identified um, in 22-23. Um, they are just finishing up their first year in tier three status. And so they have two more years before they will be eligible to exit. Um, we had one group that was within the 5% and that's the 20 and they're getting the section 1003 support. And then like you, we have 27 um, that met the tier three criteria, but they were outside the 5%. And so um, they're technically still tier three. Um, they're just not getting the additional um, section 1003 funds. Um, and then we had um, in FY23, we made 18 new tier three identifications um, and 16 of those are schools that uh, didn't met the exit, did not meet the, sorry, that met the identification criteria for tier three. And our plan also states that we are expected to support these, the feeder schools of schools that are identified for tier three sports. And um, I do think in a previous Zoom meeting, I, I wasn't very clear. So I wanna make sure a feeder school is a school that's not um, assessed with main three-year assessment or doesn't have enough grade levels to do that. So it has to have two grade levels. And so if you're operating a pre-K three school, yeah, the, yes, the third graders take the main three-year assessment, but there's no second year, second grade level, not second year, but second grade level. So that pre-K three is considered to be a feeder school. If it was a pre-K uh, pre four, it would not be considered a, a feeder school. It would have its own identification because you have third and fourth grade, which is two years. So um, those two feeder schools are, um, they can't be higher than a third grade um, school. So those are the new tier threes and we're calling those cohort threes because they were identified um, this year. Um, and then um, we have tier three, um, Right, and so we have tier three that met the criteria, which is you guys, so you guys are number six. Um, there's 29 of you who met the tier three um, identification criteria, but you're not gonna get support um, uh, that section 1003. Cause I wanna say you are getting, you're gonna get support. It's just gonna be more regional um, and it's not gonna be targeted to um, like the, the, the specifically to the school um, because this is outside the 5%. And then, um, there were uh, 86 schools that were identified for tier two in 22, 23. They're not eligible to exit because they just, they're just finishing up their second year. And because of the way tier two is calibrated, um, we didn't make aden new identifications for tier two. And then tier one, these were schools that were um, eligible to exit tier one status. And we had 35 of them that were actually able to exit tier one status. And so they're not identified for um, any level. Um, we had 69 that were eligible to exit tier one status, but they were not able to because they still have at least one student population that is experiencing challenges. And then we have 55 um, 
that are not able to exit because they were just identified in 22-23, which means they're just finishing up their first year and they still have two more years that they need to complete that three-year cycle. And then we have tier one identified this year um, and there are 30, 36 of them. So I think there's a total of like 387 schools that are identified at some for um, some level identification. Um, and I'm telling you this so that you can understand why it might be delayed. Uh, I still have four, I still have four notifications to get out to schools and, and superintendents. Um, the mostly the schools that were identified um, in previous years, and just to let them know that they're still in that status or they, um, yeah, so I've notified all the schools that have exited. I've notified all the schools that have been identified, but I still need to identify the schools that are have had no change because they're still in the middle of their three-year cycle. I know that was a little bit confusing, but I just want people to understand this is very nuanced. There's a lot of different levels to it. Now the school profiles, um, in the notification that I sent to everybody, um, there was a web page link and there was a URL and a password because that is passworded. That information is for schools. That, that information, the school profiles are not gonna be posted. Um, the only thing that's gonna be posted is on the ESSA dashboard, which I have here on the screen. This just shows um, the level of the school itself, if it's emerging, accelerating, developing, um, or um, I can't remember, or um, meeting across the indicators as a whole. It's not going to break down. It's not going to show the breakdown by student uh, popular, yeah, student populations. That's for your information. That's for schools' information. Um, but I wanted to show you that if you go to click on the Maine's Model School Sports, I think I don't believe we've updated it yet. I think it still has 22, 20, yeah, 21, 22 data on there, but it should be updated shortly. But the state assessment data, which is in this tab, and the chronic absenteeism, that is all the most recent data. Uh, they think the maids model has not been updated yet, but it should be shortly. Now, this is the public facing um, web pipe, this website. This is where anyone can go and look at that information. Uh, what I'm going to go to now is this is this is from the website that I gave you in the in the letter um, and the password. So this is the school profile, what we call the Tableau site. And this is information for schools to use. You can share it with your community. You don't, I mean, it's up to you what you want to do with it. Um, but we're we're not posting this level of information on the um for the public to see. Not on the main DOE, but you can as a school if you'd like to. So there um, the school profile, there's an end count and there's graphs. We added achievement goals this year, and we just recently, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we added the identification over time and the map to try to help schools figure out where they need to be. So this is just, I just grabbed um, a school profile and I highly annotated it, but I wanted people to see how you could be identified for um, tier three. Um, and you really wanna go down and look. So what I was gonna say, so on the ESSA dashboard, it's just gonna be this top level that's um, that's put on the ESSA dashboard. That's the public facing one. All this stuff, all the student populations, that's not gonna be posted. That's just for your information on the school profile. Um, but it's just gonna be the top level here um, that's gonna be on the ESSA dashboard. Um, and so you wanna look across, you wanna look down, or you wanna kind of look across and maybe down to see the student populations. So you wanna look at the formula here down at the bottom. You wanna see, um, the chronic absenteeism. And I know this, uh, sometimes I hear from schools, well, it was our chronic absenteeism that got us identified. Well, yes, inadvertently, yes, because most likely if you have a high attendance um, or chronic absenteeism, the students aren't in, this, aren't in school, so they're gonna affect them academically, most likely. Uh, but that's not the reason why, that's not the sole factor for why uh, you would get identified for any level. It's, um, it's a formula, so it's and. And so you could have, you have to have the chronic absenteeism over 10% and then and. So if you don't have anything after the and, then you wouldn't have been identified. It's, you gotta keep going further. Um, and then it's, it's the ELA, both of those have to be read or both of the um, math have to be read. 
they have to be emerging. So if you look at this one, um, this school did not get identified because of their academic progress. Because if you go across, you can see there's a red, but then there's a, a check mark. There's two, you know, there's a check mark and a, and a triangle, a check mark triangle, and then there's a red. So they, both of those didn't have and. So the and, this part of the equation does not, um, does not um, merit the identification. But if you go to the next part, it says or. So, and this, it's the math that got the school identified for um, for tier three. And if it had just been three of the groups or student populations, then they would have been tier one because but because every student population, the economically disadvantaged students with disabilities and the uh, white students, are uh, all these student populations, um, they're the ones that rendered the tier three status. So it's really important to look at that um, across um, across the whole, school profile page. And, mm -hmm. and I forgot, I neglected to say this in my last presentation, but if you click here on the I, and this is not, um, this is not set up for that, but if you click on the I, it'll explain, it'll give you definitions of like what merits a developing, what merits an excelling. Uh, I will give you, and it'll give you a little more explanation for that. And also we recommend um, hitting the PDF file here or the little icon here because you can download and you can copy all these school profiles. Um, if nothing else for history, I know there's a lot of change that happened over the summer. There's a lot of movement of administrators and principals. So it's just nice to have a hard copy or you can download it to, to a file, a shared file so everyone can see it. So you're not scrambling uh, to see the school profile. Because when I tell people, um, I've had superintendents reach out to me and they're like, oh, Monique, I think you're wrong. Our school was not identified. I'm like, yeah, well, in 1819, they were. And they're like, people have forgotten about 1819. So um, I recommend, um, you know, hitting that and maybe getting, uh, maybe not necessarily a hard copy, but printing off a PDF version and filing that somewhere so that is easily accessible in the future if there is some changes in your administration. And then this is just another example. This is a this is a, a school that is um, spans multiple grade levels. So in the U.S. Department of Education, there are two grade levels. There are pre-K eight, and there's um, nine twelve. So if your school spans both of those grade levels, then um, Freddie, just hold on a minute. If your if your span if your grade level spans both of those grade levels, then um, you're going to have one school profile. But you're going to you're going to be responsible for both, um, like for both indicators. So you could you could be okay on the elementary side, but you could not be okay on the high school side, and vice versa. So if you're a school that spans um, those two those two grade uh, levels, um, then that's why it can be confusing about that. So what I was trying to explain, trying to show here is that um, this school was identified one because their high school um, did not meet the graduation um, require or um, expectations. Um, they they didn't, they, it wasn't the ELA that put them in the tier three. Now they probably would have been identified for tier one, but they wouldn't have been identified for tier three. Cause if you just look down, there are check marks. So it wasn't the um, ELA, it was math for all uh, both both in high school and in EL and elementary across both the growth and the achievement and then the high school. So it's really important again that you go down here and you look at the the formula. This school actually had ELP. Not every school is going to have that because a minimum is 10. You have to have 10 in a group in a student group to be able to um, to make the identification. So yeah, and then there's the or. So I think that's really important to remember too. It's the or, and then there's two ands. And the the graduation rate is only for schools that have that both spans. Like if you're a six twelve school or you're a seven twelve school, or um, there are some K twelve schools out in Maine, and so that that school could get identified for one or the other or both. And because they're a K twelve school, it's also based on your school ID number. So I know I've had some schools that are like, well. But we're a middle school and a high school. And I said, but if you have one school ID, it, it goes by the school ID. And that, that's how it's done. So I know there are a few questions in the chat. Um, I just want to get through this school profile and then I'll, I'll look at that. Um, I will look at those questions. Um, 
And then um, we did add, there's end counts if you wanna like how many students participated. The US Department of Education is looking at participation rates and they want the Department of Education or the main Department of Education to come up with a plan of how we're going to support schools and getting their participation rates up. So that is something to think about too. And again, if it's less than 10, it does not get, um, it gets suppressed. Um, it does not count toward um, toward the main um, identification for main three year assessment. Um, and then there's the graphs. This is just something to look at if you wanna have a quick visual of which student populations and which indicators um, your students are doing well in and some of them that um, are struggling in. And again, as you can see, there's PDFs here for all of these. And then this is something new we added this year, it's achievement goals. And this is to give you an idea, we are thinking about that, like we tell schools that they have three years, but we don't really tell them the trajectory, uh, trajectory they need to be on. So this um, will help schools try to figure out where they need to be each year. So by the fall of 27, which would actually be 26 um, data, where they need to be. And if they look at their scores in the fall of 2024 and they're like, oh, we're right on that trajectory or we're not, um, kind of gives you that idea. I do wanna stress, I did highlight the 2023 in a kind of a different color because um, 23, we had to come up with uh, a baseline. So uh, what we did was oh, the collective we, the 23 is based on the state average. Moving forward with 24 and forward, the um, this will be based on the school itself. So it'll be the school's data, not the state average. It'll be the school's data. So that's why it may be a little off because starting in 24, it's, it's gonna be based on, um, or is based on an individual school's data, which is gonna determine the growth targets and the growth is supposed to be expected over a seven year period. So it's done very in small increments. It's a, um, but if you wanna really know like the details and all the calculations behind that, um, you, you can look at the plan for that. And I am gonna throw that, um, maybe I'll do it right now. So if you go to this uh, web, if you go to this, this is on the Department of Education, Maine Department of Education's accountability webpage, ESSA, and it should be right there in the middle of the page. It says state accountability. Um, the latest report that was approved, the amended report, it says February of 2024. Um, that's the date that they approved it. Now we didn't get it until like early March or their approval until early March, but that was the date of the plan. I do recommend though that it's 194 pages. So you might wanna do a, a search and find if you're looking for something particular. Um, there is a whole section on how achievement is calculated, how growth is calculated um, and what data is used for all that. So if you wanna get into that, you can do that as well. Uh, let's see, and then two more, just two more and I'll get to those questions. We also added identifications over time because your status may change depending on where you are. You may have started as a tier one and now you've progressed to a tier three. Um, you, uh, no one is a tier two because you, you can only go from a tier two to a tier three and we only made a tier two identifications last year. So there's not a possibility of anybody doing that conversion yet. But this just gives you an idea of when I was saying that we, we made our first identifications in 1819 and then um, COVID happened. So we had two years, uh, there's three years, but we had multiple years where we didn't have it. And then um, 21, 22 was actually, we had a different assessment too. So we had to get that a plan. They had to get that amended plan approved. So then in 22, 23, we made identifications. And like I said, typically we wouldn't make identifications back to back, but um, we were required to by the US Department of Education. And then the last uh, piece here is a map of identified schools. We've heard a lot from schools. They wanna know, are there schools near me? Are there SAUs that are near me? Um, so you can go onto that, um, uh, the web the URL provided, and you can go by SAU, you can go by tier, you can find out what other schools might be tier one, other schools are tier three, um, just for your information. So I'm gonna stop for a second and I'm going to see what questions are in, if there's any questions in here, I see. Um,
I know there's a question in here about if somebody's already participated in the TLN, um, would the principal of the feeder school, um, if the if the feeder school is identified as a tier one, tier two, tier three, yes, that that would be um, that would be uh, provided at no cost to the to the school. I'm not sure about if a school is not identified. If they're not an identified status, I don't believe the department will pay for that. Um, it has to be an identified tier one, tier two, or tier three. But I can double check on that. But I know that that's part of being the support that we provide. Um, and then, um, okay, we are good. And then the last piece I would just wanna talk about um, is the school improvement plan requirements for tier three um, schools identified with no support. With, and I just wanna stress that it's no section 1003 support. That means you'll get that, those schools get additional funds um, and have to complete a school improvement um, application. That being said, all tier three schools are actually also tier one schools. Um, and the way in which our Maine's model school support works is that we make the identification status at the highest level of support. So even though you may be a tier one, we're, but you're also a tier three, we're gonna default to that highest level, which is a tier three. And keeping that in mind though, for the school improvement uh, requirements, we're gonna ask that schools, uh, we're, we're asking that schools complete the ATSI or tier one requirements. Um, and because we do believe that is um, that is doable um, without additional funds. Um, and then you can read more about that in Maine's model school support, which is the same link that I provided in the chat. And then um, the next slides will talk about that. So in the statute, um, a tier one school is expected to do a um, plan, which is subparagraph B, which I'll talk about in the next slide, should also identify resource inequities and then address those re or resource inequities in their plan. And this is in sections 111, 11, little d to big C. And then when you get this uh, slide deck, you can click on that and that's a link. It should take you actually to that the same statute if you wanna know. Um, and then that subparagraph B, um, talks about more particular what that plan should include. It's um, a plan that's created in partnership with specific stakeholders. It's um, developed um, to, it's developed at the school level. I mean, it's not developed, it is developed at the school level, but it's developed to a target the school level um, needs. It's to improve the outcomes based on the statewide accountability system. So I say, look at the, you want to look at the the student populations and their data that rendered the tier three status. Um, they need to include at least one evidence-based intervention. Doesn't need to be approved by the SAU. It doesn't need to be monitored by the SAU. And if it's not working, the SAU should jump in and try to, you know, do something different to um, uh, to have the implementation be successful. So the next slide is really just a summary. Um, the school must develop a plan that is reviewed and approved by the SAU and the, sorry, the school and the SAU, and it's developed in partnership with stakeholders. It's informed by all the indicators in the main state accountability system and includes one or more evidence-based intervention. Now, <clears throat> Maine's model school support for tier one and tier two, all schools in the state um, are, could be tier one or tier two. Tier three, you have to operate a title one program, either targeted or school-wide. Now, I know there are some schools probably that were identified for this level of support um, that are already operating a Title I school-wide program, which means that you already have a CNA or an S or a school-wide plan that you already had to develop for, to be able to operate a Title I school-wide program. So you can use that plan. You don't have to create something new. You just want to make sure that you include all of the SI plan requirements. So you want to make sure that you have all the T the ATSI requirements in that um, school-wide plan that you're using for your Title I school-wide program. Um, now there's some schools that may not be operating a school-wide program, so you don't have a, a, a school-wide plan. 
but your SAU has to complete a school-wide or CNA or comprehensive needs assessment for the district to have any ESCA consolidated funds. That's tier, Title I, Title II, Title III, Title IV, Title V. And this is a requirement for ESCA funds. So if you're, uh, and technically those CNAs are supposed to have all the schools in them. So um, you could use or pull out the pieces in your SAU CNA, just making sure that you also include the required pieces for the title on the um, tier one or ATSI plan. So I, again, I don't want anyone to have to run out and create something new. Uh, try to use what you already have, just make sure it, it um, has those pieces of it. And I know there may be some schools that don't have either. Uh, actually, no, you guys would all have a CNA because you wouldn't be identified for tier three if you were not um, Title I, if you weren't operating a Title I program, either targeted or school-wide. All that being said, over on the right-hand side, the note says, all documentation needs to be kept at the school site. I am not going to ask you to submit anything to me for uh, to be for um, for this uh, school improvement plan. You want to keep it on site, um, and you but you want to have if we request it, the main Department of Education does request it. We'll expect um, we'll expect to get a copy of it. Now, school improvement will be included in FY 24-25 ESCA monitoring. So uh, I tell people have this plan available because if your SAU gets selected for an ESA monitoring for the FY 24-25 school year, you will be asked to submit if you have any tier one schools, if you have any tier two schools, if that SAU has any tier three schools with or without support, they will be asked to submit their school improvement um, plan um, uh, for those schools. So keep your documentation, be prepared, be ready to submit that if not. Um, and, and then you might also have some other, we might ask for it also um, at some point. You know, if you're participating in TLN, we want to make sure that that aligns, you know, if you're participating, we want to make sure that aligns with your, with your school improvement plan um, too. And I think, and then lastly, I think this is the last slide. Lastly, um, right now, there is no real way to get to send out notifications to the tier three schools. So, but all of you should, all your SA, you yeah, can't speak, all of your SA, you should have a consolidate, our ESA consolidated application. And we use Grants for Me as our grant software management system to do that work. So what I'm asking is that whoever your SAU um, administrator, user administrator is, if they can go in and mark the tier three principals with that are getting no support, if they can mark them with that role for the SAU in the address book, um, then when information gets sent out, like when this recording is available, uh, when it's able to be viewed on YouTube, I'll send that notification through the ESCA consolidated app. I'll click the tier one, or sorry, tier three. And then I'll also I'll have a copy of the slide deck. Um, and that way, it'll, the principal will get this information. It doesn't have to be um, sent to them through somebody else. That being said, uh, we did not, we don't currently have this as a role. We might have, I did um, put the request in last week to have this role added. So it might not be there just yet, but it should be there soon. So um, if you can have your um, your uh, user um, administrator go in there um, or at least check to make sure. Because I, when this recording is ready, I will send that, uh, that, um, that link through this website. And that is it. So any, re if this is our resources, um, professional development calendar here. And like I said, if it's a main Department of Education sponsored uh, professional development, uh, it should be at no cost to participate for schools that are identified tier one, tier two, or tier three. And then um, here's our contact information and um, how to stay connected with the DOE. And then time for any questions that you may have. And I'm going to stop recording at this point.